Yes, uh, we are live now. We are live. So good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. On behalf of SPRT, the Society for Bacteriophage Research and Therapy, I will be Bajpayee and uh, Dr. Aruna Aruna Anand. Welcome you all to this webinar. We really appreciate you all joining in today. Today we have with us Dr. Jessica Setcher and Mr. John Zeng, who are the co-founders of the US-based platform called Phage Directory. Um, so I'll just walk you through uh, what the program is like for today. As you can see that the members of uh, uh, society are with us today along with the speakers. And uh, we will, I will just take you briefly through what this talk is about. And then we will have introduction by Professor Sanjay Chipper, who is the president of... I will just take you briefly through what this talk is about. And then we will have introduction by Professor Sanjay Chipper, who is the president of... I will just take you briefly through what this talk is about. And then we will have introduction by Professor Sanjay Chipper, who is the president of... Sorry about that. So this, we have to assess. Uh, I'll start again. So um, on behalf of Society for Bacteriophage Research and Therapy, which is an Indian society, I would be Bajpayee and Dr. Taruna Anand. We welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, much appreciate you all joining in. Today we have with us Dr. Jessica Secho and Yon Zeng. They are the co-founders of the US-based platform called Phage Directory. And um, um, we have, uh, if I, uh, what the session is going to be all about, uh, I'll just briefly talk about what the, what is phase directory and what is the session about. And before that, uh, and after that, we'll have Professor Sanjay Chipper, who is the president of uh, Indian Phase Society, uh, introduce our speakers. Followed by that will be the presentation, which we are here for. So we'll have the presentation by our speakers. And after that, we'll take question answers. So we'll have uh, you please type in your questions and we will take them here. And finally, we will end the session with word of thanks from, the, from Professor Gopal Nath, who is the secretary of SPRT. So um, if you see that, um, uh, like you know that the phages are increasingly being used on patients and made into drugs and products. But this requires a vast catalog of well-characterized phages, as you would know. And you know that it's a very costly and time-consuming challenge for labs as well as biotechs. So this work of collecting, characterizing, and making the world's phages globally accessible in a way which preserves metadata, which keeps track of how each phase has and should be used, and give a proper credit, it would require the collaboration of many phage banks and institutions around the world as you would appreciate. So the phage directory, which is a unique concept, and the aim is to consolidate the phage research happening all around the world and make it available to the phage community. So these two young dynamic founders are spearheading this moment of bringing together the phage community across the globe. And uh, what they're trying to do is that they are building the technological infrastructure to support an ever-expanding global collection of well-characterized phages curated by the phage community themselves. They envision a world where researchers and phage collectors can upload their information about the phages in their collection. So as you know that the phage, the researchers and even the big labs, but still they work in isolation and uh, they carry on the respective work. But their endeavor is to create this uh, directory, I mean, they've already done rather, to where they, the collectors, the phage researchers and the collectors can upload information about the phages in their collection, uh, quickly generate and affordably publish reports on their phages and easily share license or sell their phages to generate a sustainable source of revenue to support their work. So this is very interesting and unique 
we learn more about this from them. And uh, what they have done is that, I mean, of course, I'm not going to share all the details because we would like them to share, but to uh, tell you that they are creating this directory of bacteriophages of host organisms, research labs and research institutions that work on phages and directory of organizations which include biotech startups, institutes and uh, non-profit organizations, all those who are working in the area of phage research or phage therapy. So we are very, we are indeed very happy to have you both and you are very keen on knowing about all your initiatives and the fantastic work that you're doing. And it's a great help, I'm sure, for all of us who are doing our respective research. And uh, the, another unique part of uh, this presentation or rather the speaker combination, speaker's combination is that we have a phage biologist and, a, and, a, and Jan with a technology background who has years of uh, diverse and rich experience in software development and um, service design to marketing and advertising. So having someone with this background, I'm sure brings a unique perspective and definitely enriches the whole project. So with this, um, I welcome you both. And we are very happy to have you, Jessica and Yon. And now I would like to request our president, SBRT president, Professor Sanjay Chipper. And also let me tell you, it gives me immense pleasure to share that very recently, uh, Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, has appointed Professor Sanjay Chipper as Emeritus Scientist. So heartiest congratulations to you, sir, on behalf of everybody. And I'm very glad to share this news with all those who have joined us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So over very to you, sir. Good, yeah, a very good evening to all of you. Um, I'm happy that I'm introducing the speakers of today's webinar. As Dr. Urmi Vajpayee has already told you that there are two speakers today. So I'll be introducing them one by one. Our first speaker is Jessica Secher. Um, she completed PhD in microbiology and biotechnology at the University of Alberta, where she studied molecular interactions between the gut pathogen Campylobacter jejuni and its bacteriophages. Dr. Jessica is passionate about helping the world utilize phages safely and effectively and believes collaboration among medical professionals, researchers, companies, and regulatory bodies is essential for this to happen. She co-founded Fage Directory as a way to foster such collaborations and to facilitate progress in this field. Our next speaker is Zhang Zhang. Uh, Mr. Zhang is a product designer with a background in computer science psychology and a master of human computer interaction from Carrigan Mellon University. In the past, he has worked with companies like Microsoft to design and build better digital products and user experiences. He co-founded Fage Directory to apply his experience in UX design and web development to make a positive impact in the world and in the battle against antibiotic resistance. Both Jessica and Zen envision a world where researchers and phage collectors can upload information about the phages in their collections, quickly generate and affordably publish reports on their phages that are rapidly discoverable by the global phage. In this seminar, they will provide a window into their product and ideas and share details about how FARGE researchers at all stages can get involved. So with this introduction, I hand over this my stage to Dr. Urmi. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, so there should be no more further delay. We have uh, I think we can get started. Jessica, are you ready? Jessica. Yeah, so, great. Can you hear me? Welcome. Yeah. And you can see oh. the screen. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Both. Great, perfect. Awesome. Yeah. So we're going to be doing this jointly. Thank you so much for this invitation and for the lovely introductions. I think that's the nicest introduction I've ever had. So <laughs> really appreciate it. I feel very special to be here. And uh, we really have felt from the beginning that 
Um, especially in India, there's been so many people that have been on board with what we're doing from the early days. So we really appreciate your support. Um, we would not have continued without any support from the community. And so it's really awesome to be kind of presenting here for you today. Um, and so I'm going to start the talk and then Jan's going to take over midway through. And then um, we're really excited to get a discussion going with everyone. That's our most exciting part that we want to have um, today. So we're making the world's pages more accessible, manageable, and shareable. That's what we really want to do. So you can go to the next slide. And we've, we've talked at length about our backgrounds. Um, thank you again for the lovely introduction. I'm from Canada. Jan's from the US. Um, but yeah, phage directory is, is completely global and we are trying to be inclusive of everyone everywhere. And so um, I want to take everyone back to 2017. This is when everything started for us, for Phage Directory. I was a graduate student um, studying officially at University of Alberta in Canada. I was doing a research exchange down in the state of Georgia in the USA. And I saw this tweet. So I had been studying phages in the lab. I knew all about that. I was near the end of my PhD. But I hadn't realized that it was uh, really happening that people were using phages therapeutically to treat patients um, basically in my backyard. This tweet I saw from Stephanie Strathdee, who most of you probably have heard of and followed her work. And um, so she said, phage researchers, I need people to donate phages for this patient, a 25 year old. And I was pretty close to my age at the time. And the next tweet that came after this um, was from somebody from my same university who was saying, yeah, I can share phages because this patient is dying and we, we have no other option. And so I showed this tweet to Jan, who I had met through a dance workshop of all things. We were sitting together, nothing to do with phages before this. And his background in the tech industry and, and understanding software and computers, basically, I considered him a computer person, um, which I was not, still I'm not, but I'm getting there. And so he said, well, this doesn't really make sense that Twitter is the way that your field is doing phage therapy and organizing phage sourcing. It just doesn't make sense for like, you know, this tool is great for a lot of things, but you would think there would be a better tool that better matched the actual need. It's really not the appropriate place for this last ditch um, life-saving effort to be organized. It's just so rare that the right person would see that tweet. So he wanted to uh, step in and he kind of, well, it totally came from Jan, the idea to start Phage Directory um, because he said, well, I can help build an, a better system than this. And so we started that same week. I didn't think that we were seriously starting this um, and it definitely started as a side project. Um, but Jan said, yeah, I, you know, the domain name is available, phage.directory, like we can go ahead. It's, I'm ready. And I was, you know, doing my thesis work, working on stuff in the lab. I didn't tell my PhD supervisor at first. We just kind of started building this website to see if we could collect a list of phage researchers who would be willing to provide phages if there was another patient like Mallory, who was the patient Stephanie was tweeting about. And so um, this on the screen, you can see kind of the first version. And we uh, were really surprised, pleasantly surprised that actually lots of researchers started to sign up and they were willing to donate their phages on behalf of patients. And we also, Jan built a, a simple email system that you could sign up for to get an email if there was another patient that needed phages. And so we just started going from there and we thought we'd figure it out on, on the way what was needed um, and that's kind of how it started. Next slide. And unfortunately, like devastatingly, Mallory Smith couldn't be saved and she died two days into us creating this website. So we that really spurred us on to keep going um, and to keep working with phage researchers and keep building up our directory because clearly um, people, they just, they don't have enough time to wait for the current state of phage therapy, the way that it is, is slow. It's, if you don't know the right people, you, it's not an option for you. And so this spurred us on. And so into 2018, this is just a snapshot to show one example of one of the phage hunts we have coordinated. And so this was from uh, Finland. You can see up here, our phage logo is, is there. Yeah, so this was from uh, Finland. 
Oh, here. I can hear an echo. Speech Maybe we. Yes, great. Thank you. Um, and so we got this request from Finland, and this led to 200 plus phages being sourced from around the world in about three weeks. And this was a big uh, success because there were 10 phages that actually worked on the isolate. And um, as you can see, some of the symbols on the map are different from others. And uh, that's just to show that some people would send their phages, but others would receive the patient's strain. And we were just coordinating this by email, um, depending on whatever the labs could do and um, working with them where they were at and, and really getting those phages sent to Finland where that patient was. And so we've since been helping with a lot of different phage hunting efforts or phage therapy sourcing efforts. Um, when we have a patient approach us that also has their doctor on board, and we kind of go from there. So it's really expanded. Next slide. And so we're now taking a broader view because seeing the success that we've so far had with uh, basically applying what Jan learned in other fields to this one, um, there's a lot that we can do to streamline the process. If you think of the whole process from phage is in the ground or in the water to it's being used in a clinic. Um, there's a lot of steps on that path and there's a lot of places that uh, have bottlenecks that could be streamlined. And so this is what we really wanna do. We're zooming out on this entire um, pathway, not just focusing on sourcing the phages, but where else can we apply um, the principles of just better logistics and kind of central coordination to get this going faster. So I'm gonna pass it over to Jan now and um, yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much for the introduction, Jessica. Uh, so uh, our mission is essentially rooted in these numbers, right? That I'm sure that most of you have seen and heard that, you know, in 2050, 10 million people will die every year from multidrug resistance. And and sadly, we, we're we probably going to see that year shift forward because of coronavirus, because we are using more antibiotics now than we ever really thought we would, right? Because everyone's been treating patients uh, with coronavirus with antibiotics. And, and like even before COVID-19, 700,000 people died globally from MDR already. And so in a way, um, like in a way, almost as many people have died from MDR every year as did from COVID around July. Right, so that many people have died every year just from MDR. So we're already in a sort of uh, multi-drug resistant pandemic, even though it hasn't really been something that's been covered in the news or in the mainstream media. And so in comparison, uh, antibiotics are, are taken a lot. It's a $45 billion market and over 35 billion doses are taken daily. Um, that, that, that is a lot of doses of antibiotics and to think of that being phage doses is almost impossible, right? Like, like currently we treat, I think we've seen maybe a, a couple thousand people being treated by phage every year. Um, that number will have to go up into the millions and the doses will have to probably go up into the billions. Like we don't have that capacity at all today. And in comparison, cancer treats around 10 million people annually already. So um, the world of antibiotics is going to look more and more like the world of cancer therapy. So our biggest question now is how can we scale phage treatment up to uh, treat 10 million people each year like cancer is doing right now? Well, that that is a really hard question. And with the current technologies, we, we really can't do that. But I come from the tech background. So from, from the tech sector, we ask ourselves, how does Amazon bring two hour delivery um, to each home in the US? How does Amazon Web Services power 40% of the cloud-based internet? Um, how does Airbnb make 3.6 million listings available for rent? For rent? every year, even though they're a small company of just a couple thousand people, I think. And how does Uber enable 3 million trips every day? 
Every single day, they enable 3 million rides. Well, for Uber, at least, they, they use technology and they, they create something called a positive feedback loop, which means that they drive incentives, which drives lower prices and more riders to, uh, to join their ecosystem. And when they create more demand using their app, it'll attract more drivers. Uh, to drive for them. And the more drivers they have, the better geographic coverage they have around the world. And the more coverage they have, leads, that leads to less driver downtime and lower prices and faster pickups, which means that more people will want to ride with Uber. And if more people want to ride with Uber, that'll get more drivers in, and then that'll lead to lower prices and faster pickups. So you see that there's a, um, there's a positive feedback loop where they essentially use their, their app and their system and their incentives to get the prices low and they get more drivers in and more riders in. So we can adapt the same system to Phage. And because technology, is, technology in itself uh, can be used to scale workflows, logistics, and distribution in ways that were previously impossible. Like think about how we all bought CDs in the past and you could only buy that many CDs, but now with Spotify, with iTunes, like getting music is so much easier than it used to be 20 years ago. And if you look at, for example, um, like all these examples, like Airbnb, Amazon, Flexport, GitHub, even Geo now in India is, is massive because they also use technology to, to scale their operations. And, and so everyone in the phage, everyone in the phage world that we've talked to, like the conversation has always been, do we need a database to track phages? It's like Amazon asking, do we need a database to track our books and our, you know, like everything we sell or like Airbnb asking, do we need a database to track the apartments we rent out? Like, of course, like, and no, they can't just use Excel because they manage millions, like millions of, listings every single day like they can't just use excel so in the phage world many 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 opportunities exist for us to make phages more accessible cheaper and into therapy um, so for example we have the universal phage library which we are currently building and we'll get into more later but it's a searchable data or a searchable phage data characteristics library and we want to tie it together with genome reports, with publications, with a bunch of other metadata. We're building a phage knowledge base uh, in which methods, case reports, protocols, policies, a lot of that regulatory uh, paperwork is, is going to be housed and it's going to be searchable. So for example, if you want to ship a phage from India to Germany, or if you want to request a phage from some other country to India, like you'll be able to see what other people have done and you'll be able to help other people um, who have problems, for example, shipping back and forth and so on. Um, we wanna host a physical biobank, uh, which means that phages can be globally distributed uh, around the world. So if we have um, phages for therapy, phages for agriculture, phages for research, like we can, manage them kind of like Airbnb manages Airbnb listings, right? So if we have, you know, obviously T4 phage is everywhere, but if you have other phage that can be really useful, then we can make it really easy for everyone around the world to find those phages. And we can also make it easy for everyone around the world to access the phages that you have been working on because, because I think India is a goldmine for, for new, powerful phages that might help a lot of other people um, around the world. And obviously phage access, uh, we wanna make it easy to, um, for you to get phages, to share phages. We wanna make it easy to, um, for other people to buy and sell and request phages. And that includes biotechs and pharmaceuticals. And we've heard from some groups that they're very excited to access phages that have been characterized. And um, so all these different things, um, we can help scale with technology. And some of them, a lot of it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of it's regulatory things and logistics, which 
like honestly in the tech world isn't very exciting but these are the things that make the world go around faster and cheaper and better so these are the things that we're focusing on but we need to start somewhere and this is everything I listed as like a 20 year project. And for the first year, we wanna work on the universal phage library. So again, phage directory was started as a way to find phage researchers and the bacterial hosts that they have. And in the last year we have been working on this project, uh, mostly talking with other researchers, trying to figure out what their needs are, how can we build this to accelerate their phage research, you know, like, how can we get their phages published? How can we, um, how can we just find more collaborators for them and so on? So we are building a platform for phage researchers. It's an online platform to collectively create and share phage knowledge and experience. And, and current, the site currently that we built is actually two years old and we built it very hastily and it's it's kind of almost like a blog in the, <laughs> in, in the best sense, because a lot of it, um, if you think of something like Twitter and LinkedIn, they're very automated. They're like a database driven platforms. Uh, for the current phage directory site, we had to put it together very quickly because there are all these things that we had to do. So there are a lot of things we wanted to improve on phage directory and we wanted to become more like a LinkedIn for your lab and your phages. And so this year, uh, this year we've fi finally been able to spend time doing that work because honestly, like I haven't left this house in like the last five months for reasons. Um, so that's what I've been doing. I've been just working on this project pretty much all year. And with this project, imagine it being like a LinkedIn, uh, we're connecting and building relationships between the labs and clinicians and companies and funders. Uh, we want to create a way for people to discuss and share their methods and equipment and phages and make it really easy for you to, for example, access your, uh, your collaborators, uh, TEM or sequencing equipment. And we want to, we want to just help people find their own specializations. Some people might be really good at finding phages. Other people like, um, like Jessica's lab mate was really good at TEMs for some reason, like, like you can find those specializations so people can be really good at one thing and then other people can, can take advantage of that. Like other people can find the best people in the field and then ask for their help to improve their own research. So in phage therapy, we have, we also want this kind of phage therapy positive feedback loop going um, where it's more like a phage research positive feedback loop, but this in turn will benefit therapy because uh, when the first thing that we need is people hunting for phages, we need more phages and we need to understand those phages, right? And there are so many phages in the world that we essentially, we can't just throw more bodies at this problem. We can't throw more PhD students or postdocs. We need, we need to have a system put in place that helps people get these phages. So when people get these phages, um, we want the platform to help them characterize uh, their phages with the latest methodologies. And these methodologies you get from our platform, uh, you read about them obviously in papers, but then if you find a phage that you've never seen before, you can ask other people, like go to the community, ask like, how do I deal with this? How do I store this phage? How do I, you know, who else has worked on this before? And then of course, those researchers, they become your collaborators. Right, like you borrow their equipment, you borrow their methods, and they they guide your your they guide the research for the phages that that you found, they've hunted for, they might not have worked on before, and so together you find out more about these phage, and you publish your phage on GemBank. Uh, we're we're preparing to create, well, we're creating this GemBank publishing assistance tool because we heard from some people that it can be difficult to publish a lot of data to GemBank and we're, we're building a tool that makes it easier. And we also have something we call Phage Insights, which is going to be like a small phage genome uh, announcement. Basically, here's the phage, here's all the research along with it, here's the data along with it. But it's not going to be like a $900 publication or $600 publication like 
it is right now with ASM. Uh, don't know the price yet. It might be free. We haven't really thought about that. But there, there is a real, really big need for these phages to be characterized and publicized, like published, like to made it made available to the world, not just published in like the academic journal sense. Like they need to be public to the world so that other people can work on them. And that's what we mean by publish. Like we just want to make them available. And we are putting together like a peer review system uh, that I can I can talk about that later too. But we're putting it together a peer review system that makes it faster for people to to peer review these insights as well. And then once these faders are published, we want to be able to um, assist people in sharing these faders to the wider community so that once people know about this phage and how it works, you know, labs in anywhere from like South America to Norway to anywhere in the world should be able to access your phage. They should be able to, you know, buy with a click or request with a click and all the paperwork should be filled out. Like, how do you import it? What about um, Kyoto, Kyoto protocol uh, paperwork? Like everything should be filled out and ready for you in a click. And so having a system like this together, um, that'll help us collect more research data and findings from the rest of the community, right? Like if more people work on these phages, more people will generate a better understanding of the phages, more people produce more data, more publications, and that will lead to more phage hunting, right? Because there's so many phages out there in the world that we we don't know very much about. So, so our goal with this phage therapy loop, with this positive feedback loop is that we want to encourage, we want to create something like this to encourage more people to find more phages, characterize more phages. And in essence, this will help patients, right? Because the more phages we understand, the more phages we have available, the better chance it is for a patient to get a phage that's already been characterized that we know everything about, like including its toxicity, its AMR genes and everything. So the more phages we have, the more patients we're going to help. So this is, this is an, a breakdown of how we imagine um, our system working. So on the right side, you have three large circles. And these, these names are more internal product names. Uh, the top one is Phage Dex. If you ever played Pokemon as a child, I actually never had played Pokemon. I just started playing Pokemon last week on a Game Boy Color. It's, it's strangely fun. I have to stop myself from playing it. But uh, so the phage dex is like a pokedex of phage. Um, that means that it's like an encyclopedia for all the phage that are found in the world and what is, what is special about them. Like what are their special abilities? Uh, the phage exchange is what we call the marketplace. Um, imagine it like an eBay uh, for your phage. But of course, when you work with collaborators, you might not buy or sell. You might just request them and make it easy to really to just ship them out without any money transferred. Um, and then FIMS on the left side, or I guess in the center of the slide, FIMS is our phage inventory management system. And what that means is that we're building, we're building an interface that makes it really, we aim to make it really easy for you to manage the phage in your lab. So for example, uh, if you're, if you hunt for a phage and you want to sequence, you send the phage to a collaborator and they sequence it and they characterize it. And instead of swapping emails back and forth and sending uh, zip files back and forth, they would just log into the same system like you would do with Google Docs and they would just write in their data. And so kind of like a Google Docs or a Google Sheets, uh, where you just imagine a place where each phage can be worked on by many, many people. And also this, this phage inventory management system also helps you keep track of where your phage are. So what, in what box and what freezer and what grid your phage is and what, what are the experiments you've been running on them. So it's something like a cloud collaborative lab notebook for your phage. And then once you're ready to submit your information or, or publish it to the rest of the world, we're going to make it easy for you to publish on GenBank and we're going to make it easy for you to publish on Phage Insights. 
And also excitingly, we're talking with some other publishers and we're building a data API or a, a way to link our data with their, their journals. So we want, we want to be able to, um, we want research to be able to, to go to journals, read about a published phage. And then if they, if the publication uses like one or two or three phages, you should be able to click on that phage, see what are all the metadata for that phage and then request that phage for yourself for the clerk. So we call all of this the phage atlas. And the phage atlas is the next generation of phage directory. It's the phage directory we've always wanted to build. We just, we just had to find out more information about what we're exactly we're building. And so in the last year or two, we've talked to hundreds of researchers and students. And now we have a good sense of what it is we need to build. And all that culminates into Phage Atlas. So Phage Atlas is built with a few core tenets. And the first one is to never lose track of your phages. Uh, we heard from many labs that, um, that the phages can get, get messy, that like they can get physically lost or they can get you know, metaphorically lost in the sense that um, once this phage has been submitted to a culture collection, we don't know where that phage has been published anymore. Like the culture collection uh, will check that phage out to many other labs and it'll be published in many other places, but uh, the attribution rarely goes back to the first person that got the phage, the hunted for the phage in the first place. The second tenet is we wanna find phages and hosts to power your research, right? So again, going back to the feedback loop, uh, some people are going to be very, very good at hunting for phages. Other people like me who have never really worked in the wet lab, like I'm just really getting into bioinformatics right now, like phage bioinformatics. I think it's the coolest. I'm really clumsy. I'll probably shouldn't be working on the wet lab and I don't have a biology degree, so that doesn't help. So people like me don't want in the, in the lab, but I would still want your data so I can run my algorithms on top of your phage data. So some people are good in the lab, some people are good at hunting phages, and some people like me who, who should only be working on the computer. But together, I don't, I don't need to go into the lab because I can just get access to your phage, right? And then, and then so everyone has their own specialty and with each person's specialty, they can work together. And the third tenet is we want to be able to share a bookmark and discuss papers and preprints. And <laughs> this is something that's come out from a need from, from running Capsid and Tail. We get a lot of submissions for uh, stories or for um, like things in the what's new section, things in the community. And right now the Capsid and Tail is, again, it's a newsletter, it's a blog. And it's hand curated. Most of the things are most of the um, descriptions are written by Jessica and we have a growing team of really awesome collaborators and uh, volunteers and they're, they're so awesome to work with. And so when we first started, we were like, oh man, is there ever going to be enough news for, from the phage world to cover in a weekly newsletter? And, and fast forward to this year where we're like, well, we need to make one newsletter a month be just news because otherwise we can't cover everything. Like that, that is how things have shifted since we started. And so with Phage Atlas, we wanna create um, almost like a forum. Um, I don't know if you guys remember like old websites like Dig or um, StumbleUpon, but we're, we're essentially considered building a system like those for people to find papers and preprints to be able to create their own uh, journal, um, it's called journal clubs to be able to discuss, you know, the intricacies of a paper and share the results of the journal club. And the next tenet is we want to try new ways of working with phages um, or share your own methods. So again, going back to that previous point of like sharing papers, uh, we also need a way for people to share their own methods and protocols. So with this, uh, we are working together with protocols.io 
uh, Lenny Tittleman, the founder of Protocols, is super awesome, and he's helped us like all the way from the beginning. Like, like from the very, very, very beginning, he like he had a phone call with us, and he was really encouraging. He he gave us all the all this information on, on how to start. So Protocols IO, they have been a very, very close supporter since the very, very beginning. And and basically the both of us, we, we both have the core mission of like making it easy for people to replicate other people's methods. Because phage, we, heard, we constantly hear they're really hard to work on and you shouldn't be working on them yourself. You should be having a supportive community that you can ask questions with, that you can share your ideas with. And, and right now it's happening through papers, which is which are expensive to publish and it's very slow to publish. And there's no reason why we have to go that route to share methods. So with all that in mind, uh, we have this site, this page uh, at phage.directory slash atlas. And we invite you to sign up. And right now the phage atlas is very much in beta. Uh, we're still working on a lot of the systems, a lot of the, a lot of the systems don't even have interfaces yet. They're just database connections right now, which is why we don't have a lot to share. But we're currently uh, splitting our roles between me and Jessica. I'm the one frantically coding and designing the, the app myself. And Jessica is the person who's, um, some of you might have received uh, calendar invitations from her. You might have talked with her. Uh, she's frantically calling, frantically calling everyone we know to kind of guide our development process and tell me, okay, these are the things that should make us better. Like these are the things that people want, and these are the things that people need, and so on. So, uh, so becoming a foundational member at Phage Directory slash Atlas, that that isn't. Like we don't have a beta yet, so there's nothing you can use right now, but we really want to hear from everyone how, how you work with phages, how you hunt phages in the wild. If you're new to phage, tell us what are the things that will help you get us going? Like, sorry, what are the things that, what are the things that will help you get going in phage? Like, like what protocols are, are like, are you looking for like, the top 10 or top 50 papers to read? Are you looking for, like, what are the things that you need that can accelerate your phage research? So there are a lot of things that we're thinking about. And going back to that list, there are so many things that we could be working on now, but as a two person team, we can't work on everything. So we would like you to tell us what you wish your perfect phage app or phage website would be like tell us everything you need and most likely we'll build it for you so phage atlas or phage actually slash atlas is a place where you can sign up and i'll be emailing you personally and you can tell me everything that that you want and i'll probably invite you to the beta at some point so that you can play with the different tools that i'm working on and and eventually with your help uh, phage atlas is going to be the best app it can be for for you for all the phage researchers jessica do you want to close out yeah so we like to end on this because this is mallory who started us off on this path and uh she died and she didn't need to because they later found a phage for her that actually replicated on her strain and it was a speed thing that led her not to get that treatment in time. And that's, it's, it's one thing if we have people dying of diseases that we can't treat, but it's pretty hard to, uh, to know that logistical barriers are getting in the way we have the treatment and we just need to organize um, to make it more available. So we're very driven by this mission that it's, it's just a waste to not do what we think we should be doing right now. Like to not take all of the amazing phage research and phage discoveries that are being made and try to stick it together so that it can work better and generate this feedback loop. And, and so that all these researchers like myself, when I was a researcher, um, feeling like I didn't have an impact for, you know, 50 years, maybe I would one day like to, to really connect that, 
that's what's driving us. So we like to end on this reminder that it's real people that we're trying to help. And it's really possible. It's not, we don't have to wait decades and apply for grants first and then wait. We can actually do a lot right now. So we're really excited to get going with this new phase. Next slide, we'll talk about acknowledgements. Um, and so, yeah, we have first the bottom right with our funding. Mozilla Foundation has provided funding to us and we're really grateful for that. Um, and the NSF i program and the Helmsley Trust as part of the Mozilla funding. Um, this has helped us with small grants here and there to help us go and travel and talk to researchers. Um, and we would have traveled to India last year for the conference that you guys had, um, but it just didn't work with our travel plans. And then, yeah, it looks like we should have taken advantage of that then because who knows when we'll be able to now, but we're very keen to keep doing that when we can. Um, and yeah, we've worked with countless different research partners so far that have helped us understand uh, what the reality is for phage researchers in all different countries and at all different stages, because there's a very wide diversity of, of stages people are at. And um, yeah, that's been enlightening to, to hear from everyone. And we have um, some a sponsor, Jaffrel, who is um, in the kind of bottom left, has sponsored us. And um, Phages for Global Health, we are working together on this to digitize their uh, phage research curriculum. And we're trying to find <clears throat> the best ways to tie that in with what we're building. And we see so much possibility for integrating what we're doing with Phage Atlas into um, an actual training program and having you be able to go through a training program. And um, as you're going, as you're learning what to do, you have a place to input that data and you know how to input it and what it should look like because we have that embedded into the system um, to help you succeed. And yeah, then um, an Innovation Gateway at University of Georgia, that was the first group that uh, gave us our little initial push and that was a business accelerator. And if any of you are interested in, um, for, from a careers perspective, like most universities have an office like that nowadays where you, you can go learn how to become kind of an entrepreneur with your science background. I think um, it's such a, an amazing place to go and they will help you and they really helped us. So we're really excited to hear your questions um, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica and Jan. Uh, can I hear? So it was exciting to see your journey, all your entire journey and your ambitious projects. And uh, as we, I told you that the research, the audience today are mostly phage, uh, phage researchers. And uh, we do work in lab, as Jan said, that there are phage hunters and those who do research. And then some of us, some of uh, uh, people like you who are uh, making, uh, making a platform available to all of us for uh, making our research accessible to others and also have the ability to have access to others' expertise. And that's what is needed today because nobody can do it all uh, alone. And these kind of collaborative um, uh, initiatives which you have proposed, uh, can you, is there a noise here? Uh, which is uh, really, uh, we really appreciate your effort. And I, there are several questions, but before I ask questions, um, I have one question. Uh, this phage directory, as I said, Jessica, that uh, I really appreciate all the efforts that you both are putting in. Um, it is needed very much because we work in our respective labs and doing this kind of a global exercise and you know putting all those positive feedback loops are essential. And phages are too many to, for anyone to handle. They are really in abundance. So making them available to everybody and in real time. And your inspiration for this project is inspiring for all of us. Because uh, as you said rightly, that phages is one area of research which can bring you to a translational benefit very soon. In uh, You don't have to wait for decades. As in case of Hapfus lab also, if you remember, the phages which were discovered by the undergrad students were used for therapy. So uh, at any point you pitch in in your res uh, phage research, it has a potential to be useful for therapy or for biocontrol or any other application. 
So we, uh, I am sure that everybody enjoyed your talk very much and we thank you again. And let me now go through the questions from the audience, um, which are already listed by Rita and Saroj. So I will take the questions um, from here. So first of all, it is from Taruna Anand only. Dr. So I may I tell you, Dr. Taruna Anand also um, maintains a FH bank, a physical bank um, at her institute, and she's been doing it for some years. But it's in. Uh, she will maybe tell what stage it is. What question she's asking that uh, kindly explain a little about the status of FH Repositories World Bank. So when you are um, contacting FH banks across the world, what is the status like? I mean, how do they uh, maintain the bank and how do they make the pages available to others to the community? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that question. That's really interesting. Um, so we've been, uh, that's been part of our journey um, is, is seeking out people who have physical phage banks. Uh, a lot of them are kind of public repositories, like there's one, um, uh, NCTC is run by Public Health England, for instance, and there's a Felix Sorrell Center in Canada that's run through the Université Laval, and um, we have a few, there's a handful of examples, the Phage Bank of Korea um, and the DSMZ in Germany, there's kind of, you know, every continent seems to have one, um, and we've talked to them, and for the most part, they do uh, a great job of collecting phages if people want to send them, then they're great. They, they receive them, they make them available. Some of them have websites that are easier to navigate. Um, some of them kind of don't focus so much on the website. Um, and it's one thing that we've noticed. Uh, I mean, they get really specialized at how to store them and they're a resource for that, for the whole community. I think we want to bring what they know about storing phages to others, so it's easier for people to start their own phage banks and maintain them. Um, but one limitation we found is every phage bank, first of all, there's not that many of them, um, but every one of them seems to have their own kind of mandate. Um, like for instance, one might only focus on getting one phage from each taxonomic unit or each um, say genus, and they don't want you know lots of different T4 variants because they just want representatives. They're trying to be more of like a museum that um, allows you to represent diversity because nobody has the resources to collect all phages. Um, and then the other limitation is that the paperwork for uh, getting phages um, to be allowed to be used commercially, for instance, like if a biotech company wants to use those phages, it's pretty hard for most of the banks that we've talked to to it, it's not that it's hard, it's just that it takes a long time and um, it's not streamlined. So most of these banks are for strictly research purposes and we, we want to help open that up to other possibilities and therapeutics is the other possibility. Most of them are not really set up to provide pages for, for therapy. Um, but it's not because it's impossible, it's just, you know, who whose permission do we need for this phage? And, um, is it safe and who's going to prepare it? So there's lots of pros and cons with the current ones that have it, are, exist. And we're really grateful that they've been able to share about their challenges. Um, but yeah, we want to link them all. That's, that's another part of what we've been working on is how can we start by indexing all the phage, phage collections that exist already and just connect them digitally so you can search them all at once as a researcher and you can order them uh, order from all of them or any of them um, with one platform. Sure. So, so this is a follow-up question, and not follow-up, so a question from the same person. Taruna, what are the basic requirements that a phage is accepted you know, for therapy? So for if therapy? If, if, yeah. So if at all from your phage alerts, any phages were actually taken by patients or taken for a patient. So what were the yeah. requirements for a phage to qualify? Yeah. So, um, we the way that we do it now is we try to kind of play more the role where we we take a bit of a hands-off approach and we try to really find the right expert for each situation that's going to be able to give that kind of answer and because we're working globally every almost every case that we get to become a part of like every phage request comes from a different country so it's it's not right right now it's not easy for us to just kind of have like one size fits all um system 
system of instructions. But for instance, if a request comes from India, we would say, okay, do you have your doctor on board? Do they want uh, to pursue phage therapy for you? Okay, if that's true, we will go and find help you find sources of phages. And then those labs that respond to us will say, what do we need to do to prepare this? We don't know how to prepare a therapeutic phage prep. Are we even allowed to? Um, are we in trouble if something bad happens? All those kind of questions, we, um, we try to just direct to somebody else who's already been a part of that um, in kind of the, the relevant region. And so uh, usually it comes down to, we do for each case have to find a lab that's already done clinical phage prep before and um, individual regulatory agencies, the, the doctor has to talk to them. So in the US, for instance, the FDA, like we're going to help the doctor know that they need to call the FDA, but we're not calling the FDA. We're getting that doctor to do it. And then the FDA tells them what's needed in terms of how clean the phage prep has to be. And then that message, we can help pass it along to the researcher who has volunteered to make that phage but if they're not comfortable getting it to a clinical clean prep to, to meet the standards, they, they certainly don't have to. We will just keep trying to find someone who will. Um, I hope that answers it. It's kind of an ad hoc, like we, we deal with it differently each time. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add that we are collecting all that information about what people want. And eventually that'll make it back to our system. Um, the best, uh, not the best, but the most uh, most clear one we have seen so far is the uh, system put together in Belgium. Uh, they call it the phage passport. And they, it's not a system for compassionate phage therapy, but they have this phage passport thing that essentially tells you like for each phage that is uh, allowed to be used in a, a pharmaceutical preparation, like they have to be, they have to have passed these these different things like like these toxin levels and and whatever right but like so each phage has to have an approval like a stamp of approval and a sheet in this phage passport so so we're looking at them as like the north star but of course once there are more phage um phage cases happening like more information we're going to be able to get from each country yeah okay uh, Hans Lipsish asks that uh, are there phage therapy RCTs being done somewhere? What is the Sorry, update the on that? Phage therapy. Randomized uh, clinical trials. So oh, are they being yeah. done? Um, yes. So it's exciting to see. We were just at a biotech conference last week, a virtual one, um, that was more on the side of looking at all those biotech companies that are in the middle of clinical trials with phages. So they are making progress. There's several in Europe, in, uh, in the US, some in Canada that were there. Um, and we're starting to see, I think they're just kind of all in the middle of, of them. Um, so far there's been about three phase two clinical trials randomized with phage that have been done. Um, the most recent being the one that wrapped up the Fagoburn trial in Europe. Um, a couple of years ago. So it's been a little while since there's been new results from any of these trials, but they're definitely underway. I don't know the exact number of how many are underway. And yeah. um, that's a piece of data we want to eventually be able to show on yeah. a dashboard. Going into this year, we were really excited about all these new clinical trials and then COVID-19 happened. It's obviously not, it, it has been kind of a hit to the clinical trial uh, recruiting phase because they all started recruiting patients. And then of course, with the clinic, with COVID-19, like I'm sure that has affected a lot of the clinical trials because going into this year, late last year, we were tracking all of these teams ramping up for clinical trials this year. And we were thinking that, wow, 2020 is going to be the year for clinical trials and phase to get started. But now we haven't really heard very much, so I'm not really sure what's going on, but you know, fingers crossed. Yeah. Sure. And then Corona happened, so everything yeah. is put on hold. 
Exactly. Okay, so so Ananta Raja Ramlingan wants to know uh, what are all the crucial bottlenecks which prevent wide wide application in the field. So if you when you have discussed with several researchers, so any application not just for human therapy but other applications also. Given that they are so abundant in nature, uh, what are the bottlenecks which prevent the actual application in the field of these features? In the field, yeah, yeah. So it's it's great to have someone remind us that we're not just focused on therapy. Our talk kind of made it sound like that. And that's certainly where our motivation has come from. But this can, this platform is going to be agnostic of actual application. It will be able to find phages, you know, collect phage data for agriculture, for aquaculture, and any kind of, you know, water treatment. We're, we're trying to stay open to all of that. And I think each application has its own bottlenecks. So that's what we've been finding. Um, for instance, you know, obviously with the therapy, we know that it, you know, you have, a, have to have a certain kind of patient that even qualifies to get phage therapy. And that's, that's a really troublesome bottleneck and you have a very short time. So you have to get everybody to go fast. Um, so the actual prep of phages is slow, uh, is kind of a limiting factor. But then when it comes to something like um, agriculture, like we talk to groups that are looking at putting phages in chicken food or chicken water, and they're not dealing at all with that issue with therapy. Um, but they're trying to, they're at the stage where they're trying to formulate their phages in a way that, you know, they can be reliably administered to chicken feed. Like it's not really, you know, they're at a different stage of the process. So, um, that's one example there. And I'm sure there's regulatory concerns in a lot of these areas, and it depends on the country, but so far that we've found, you know, bottlenecks could be at any stage. It's, it's almost like, it's all a collection of bottlenecks, really. It's like, which part of this is easy? Like all of the steps right now are pretty manual and pretty, you know, handmade. And um, it's, it's kind of daunting if you think of it all at once, but, um, yeah. but it's also kind of cool because any step that you focus on, just like any bottleneck you try to widen, it's like, it has the potential to really speed everything up because, you know, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. yeah. So like in a sense where we, we, as Jessica said, there's so many bottlenecks of anything from research to regulations to like anything on that big list that I listed, like those are all, just summarizations of bottlenecks that we've found. And like what, what we're th looking at, how we're looking at ourselves is like, we want it to be the glue that keeps all the phage together. And so from a glue perspective, we just want to make a stronger glue, right? So like I'm a systems thinker. And so from a system standpoint, it's like we want to build a better system in order for, you know, other things to happen better, right? So. Like if we are a stronger glue, then we can keep everything else, you know, closer together. We can keep everything else like running more smoothly. I'm just and when, another one thing to mention is that we like to look when there's too many bottlenecks. One way to go about it is to look at what's actually common in all of these different um, sectors. And one thing we have highlighted is really the lack of standardization when it comes to phage characterization. So in all of those fields, whether you're getting phages for aquaculture, agriculture, therapy, uh, veterinary medicine, water treatment, you really like it comes down to the same fundamentals at the bottom before it starts diverging. And so the best bang for our buck and for, you know, the best use of our time is focusing at the, the bottom before it branches off. And if we can get kind of a streamline, a pipeline going where everybody knows kind of, you know, you start with a phage, you report this about it. Where did you find it? And what does it look like? And then you do this and then you do this. And, and we just stack up all that data and line it up beside each other so that, you know, you have a foundation to draw from. Then anyone coming in going, oh, I'm, I am an entrepreneur in the field of agriculture and phages look interesting. How do I get started? They have this foundation of solid, you know, well-characterized phages and that's common no matter what industry. Sure. So I am sure it would be daunting for you because you meet all kinds of bottlenecks. We researchers have our own bottlenecks, but in our yeah. respective area, and you have collective bottlenecks to face. So <laughs> it's a daunting task for you. Definitely. Yeah. 
All right. So Atif Khan wants to ask: Is page tax, uh, which in John had presented, page tax and page exchange and FIMS, are they currently accessible, or mm -hmm. is it in the pipeline? Um, are they? They are all. They are just parts of the phage atlas. They are like different internal nicknames for like what what is this part supposed to do? What is that part supposed to do? But they like the phage atlas is the encompassing project name. But are they all accessible? Are they all like live? Is what the question? Uh, oh, is. sorry. Yeah. So they are not live right now, but we are again getting we're we're going to onboard you slowly, and then we are going to make all the interfaces for you that makes them live. Like right now, they're just a collection of databases and code that functions in the back end. But um, so because of a user experience background, like I want, I know how crucial it is to make the front end, the, the interface correct, which is why I don't really have one right now. Um, so they are not usable right now, but uh, once you join this Atlas thing, I will start adding you to the beta, and I'll be able to give you an account, and you can be able to test things out uh, over the next um, over the next half year or so. Because a lot of these pieces are going to um, probably the beta parts of the beta are probably going to be put together between now and December. And by December, by mid December, we're going to have a very light system together that hopefully touches on a lot of some of the basic needs. But yeah, like it's currently a very heavy work in progress. And one thing to add to is if you're a phage bank, like you collect phages, um, that portion where we've already started to have phage banks send us kind of their, either their metadata, so just like all the category headings of what they collect about their phages, or in some cases, um, yeah. just give us access to all the data and so that we can we're using that and we have been for a few months now to actually build the underlying database. Like how do we know which characteristics to even track? And, and so what we're doing is going by what everyone else is already co uh, collecting. So if you have a physical phage bank and you're listening, um, we would love to hear from you on that level. That's a little bit separate from the Atlas. And just, yeah. if you can share with us what what it looks like, you know, what, what does your Excel sheet look like? And, yeah. and if we can index those phages in the early version of the um, public yeah. phage atlas, then yeah, people will be able to find them and use them if, if you're open to them being used for whatever purpose. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is slightly separate from the phage atlas, but we are also building a search engine for all the phage uh, culture collections, all the phage collections around the world, like ATCC, NCTC, and Felix Earl, and so on. And if you do have a collection, like for example, we heard that Dr. Uh, Gopalnath has a collection, or Dr. Mm -hmm. Like, if you want a website built for your collection, if you want a place for people to, to go and be able to request phages, yeah, talk to us. Send us your your list of phages. Send us your Excel spreadsheets because we. That, that system pretty much already works. We've already built it out. Like it already indexes all the phages. Again, I don't have a good enough of a user experience like design to make it live on the site, but I'm already using it. Like I'm already using the technology for our own work. So, John, if I can ask, so the people who submit their phages, whether metadata, metadata or yeah. physical phages uh, information, so uh, the credit, uh, how do you ensure the credit and the propriety rights, etc.? Because phages, uh, it's um, uh, it's your proper property, intellectual property. So maybe there is apprehension amongst researchers on sharing the phages. Mm -hmm. So if you could allay those fears, since um... Jan. Do you want to yeah. talk about that? Yeah. So, uh, on on one sense, um, yeah, we we recognize that that attribution is really important, and it's something that honestly has kind of been lacking in the field currently. Um, but what we're doing right now is we're we're getting we're giving each phage a place, like a place of reference, kind of like how in LinkedIn you have your profile of like this is. This is you, and this is everywhere you've worked before. Like for us, we want to give each phage a place. Like this is where, like all the publications for phages happen. Like these are all the collaborators that have worked on this phage. 
these are all the people that have contributed or contributed to the characterizations of a phage. Like in that way, we can track who has who has done something for the phage, right? So we want to share the, the credits. Um, from a phage collection standpoint, um, a lot of things that we're collecting for a phage collection, we are mostly collecting what, we're collecting the metadata, meaning we're collecting the information that people care about the phage. We're, uh, please don't send physical phage to us because we don't have a web lab. <laughs> we are not a digital, we're, we're only a digital collection. We're yeah. not a physical collection. We don't have yes. phages, we don't have a lab. Yes. So please don't send, please don't send us anything like that or the US <laughs> customs. Unless, yeah. Yeah, of course. So you have you're like Uber, right? You're the Uber or I, you're the yeah. Uber or Amazon. Yeah. Each other. That was a great analogy. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, what I meant here was that uh, so, I mean, even for people to share their pages amongst the banks. So if did you did you feel that researchers have this uh, apprehension? Because I feel that one is that there are uh, regulatory processes to be taken care of, material transfer agreement, etc. Even if their pages. Um, isolated from yep. local environment. So those are the things I think which block the very easy exchange of phages across researchers. Uh, you know, you've yeah. got to have letter, several paperwork for, uh, it's not a free share. So maybe in some exactly. parts it is, in some parts it's not. So that's somewhere I think researchers are apprehensive about. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, and I, so I'll come to the next question. So Santosh Korat uh, also is uh, interesting. He wants to know that I think you've covered this, that how to connect with somebody who is working on phages, which can be used for biocontrol. So, I mean, I think there are several questions on these lines that how do they, probably they are new to, so you have to tell them how do they uh, connect to, so how would you connect them to yeah. people who are working on phages? Yeah, so we get a lot of emails um, asking questions like this. And um, one way, if I know, you know, we have a growing database, both a public one on our website of phage researchers, phage labs, and phage organizations that have a little description of what they do. So um, we have that and we can point people to that, but we also have kind of an internal one that isn't public because the public one is all opt in. So people sign up to be on there only if they want. But if we know about somebody who hasn't yet signed up um, for whatever reason, we can also kind of just when people email us, we can go through that and see if we can find the right person for them and then ask that person for permission to share and connect. So I'm happy to do that. And I do that fairly frequently via email, but um, a quicker way too is to use our community message board. And so often I'll send that to people, the link for posting and it's, you can uh, easily use it to post whatever question you have and then give yours some kind of contact info and then people will read it in our newsletter, which goes out to almost a thousand sage professionals now every week. And so that will get featured in there um, and that's free to use, that will be forever. So that's another good way. Um, we can also amplify people's tweets. Um, there's a bunch of channels that we can go through, but um, eventually we'll be able to systematize this a lot better too. Um, so that it won't be so manual and won't be so dependent on me thinking of who's the right person, you know, um, it'll, we can think of ways of making that effective with tech, but right. yeah. So I think this Akshay Dubey also had a similar question. I think I, Akshay, you would have also got answer for your question through this same, um, the question which has just been answered. I'll take the next question. So we will be taking, we'll be here maximum till 10 PM. So I'll be a little quick. Uh, we we uh, um, so I'm sorry to not able to pronounce uh, we okay Kanantas um, we cannot not say okay so you know the names which is are also uh, known so his concern is we I'm really sorry I'm not able to pronounce it well Kanan Kanantasan. Uh, he's asking, um, uh, it's a general, again, a query that virulent and drug resistance genes are present in phages. And so that's what also is a big risk considered to be using phages as uh, for storing in banks or for using. So how is this addressed? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so how is it addressed currently and how will it be addressed? I would separate out those two because um, in the future, we that's, that's a really important 
characteristic, we would see it as one of many characteristics of a phage. So um, what kind of genes it has of a certain type, for instance, with therapy, people don't want lysogeny genes in there, or they don't want toxin genes, or yes, actual antimicrobial resistance cassettes, that would be horrible. So we would want to be, you know, if you picture it as a database, having a column that is, you know, does it have these genes? Yes or no, or which genes may be problematic or which genes match um, this function. So we will be building that in and that's kind of part of the consideration because we have seen that that kind of data gets collected in some of these collections. And um, I think the CFAGES, phages DB collection does the best job of going at the gene level. Um, most of the collections don't do that, um, but definitely for therapy, it's always kind of like, uh, it comes down to say in the US, the FDA would say, we need it to have none of these toxic genes. And they will tell you, they will tell a researcher what they mean by that. But it's, it's very different depending on which agency you're going to go through. And I think probably most of them don't know yet what, like they also need to be told, like, what should we care about? So that's, we're still early in, in that, but of course it's, it's an essential safety mechanism to build in and make sure we're tracking that about phages. Yeah, and from a from a just like data standpoint, it's kind of like um, it's it's kind of like when when we start putting together a system for people to collect this data. Like in the beginning, a lot of this information, like the sequences, are going to be um, like unknown, right, or like not clear, like what these genes do. But the the plan is to also have another side of like bioinformaticians be able to get access to this data and then run their code or run their like like AMR detection algorithms on top of the sequence data in order to to predict or in order to like see, okay, are these possibly dangerous or are these possibly fine? So that like the more information we have, the more we can start using like machine learning and other tools to kind of guide us the right way. But of course it's a monumentally hard problem and like like with BLAST and NCBI and like what GenBank's doing has been great, but that is just the tip of the iceberg. And what we're going to be doing is also the tip of the iceberg. Like this is such a difficult question. Sure. Uh, so adaptive phage therapeutics, I think already is doing this. Uh, are you aware of it? Uh, yeah, they have a great collection and, and they're one example of a group that has gone ahead and um, started to put together kind of their own pipeline for how they um, characterize a phage or how they, you know, what checkpoints they have their own method of figuring out which phage is gonna be good for whatever application. And that's um, something we also, Jan mentioned in Belgium, they have their own sort of phage passport. And that's, you know, a, almost like a checklist, like, does it have these kind of genes? Does it have this amount of endotoxin in the prep? What titer is it? Um, does it have stability? So I think, yeah, adaptive phage is definitely one of the groups that um, we see as one of the leaders with getting getting more streamlined about how they process. We don't know exactly how they do it, but we know that that's built into their strategy. It has to be because they're doing it from an approach of like a large library of phages quickly find the right one. That's kind of what we want to replicate on a, uh, a different scale. All right, so now I'll take just a few more questions because we are sort of running out of time. So, uh, Vijay, uh, no, this, uh, uh, so Smitha Menon wants to know that can phage atlas help with protocols or methods for studying phage characteristics? Yeah, yeah, so that's really exciting. That's the first thing we're building in, uh, right now because we, uh, the, the project that we are currently working on with uh, phages for global health they, uh, we are building this uh, educational tool, right? And then part of that is having protocols for, for lab work. So we are putting together a way for, for protocol and methods sharing uh, and collecting methods and protocols. Yeah, we've heard that a lot from people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's, so that's the number one priority right now. Sure, that's great. Vijay Gondal has a suggestion to make, suggestion to make. He says that for Phage app, if you can use it uh, Android compatible, unlike ResearchGate, as most of the Indian researchers, Indians and researchers from developing countries prefer to use Android over iOS. 
Oh. Like, ah. That's a really good feedback. Like people uh, are using phones instead yeah, Android. of more Android than iOS. Yeah. iOS is exclusive. And um, yeah, so the first version, we're going to do it completely on the web and the browser. So like over Chrome or Safari or Firefox, mm -hmm. uh, because building an app takes a lot more time that I don't have. So that pro that's probably going to come way in the future if you ever get funding. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we'll definitely do an app. But for now, we don't have any okay. plans to get in the phone. So it'll be browser-based, OK. Exactly, yeah. So Atif Khan has another question. He wants to ask, uh, are you planning to introduce any short training sessions on mathematic tools in page research? Oh. I think this is a very hot area, and uh, it's much it's much is needed. I mean, a lot of researchers would need this training. Thank you for that suggestion. That's something we've also heard bubbling up. And uh, yeah, it's starting to be clear that that's I mean, we can definitely host training sessions. We can build that into um, the, the training program we're already working on with Sages for Global Health, like bringing in a bioinformatics component. Yes. Um, mostly we want to provide a platform for people who are experts at this to actually be able to easily teach others. So um, it's not a matter of if we're gonna do that, it's just a matter of when and how, and do we do that soon or later? So the more people that, um, tell us that's the, the part they're stuck at, um, yeah, the more likely we'll build it sooner. So good to know. Mm -hmm. All right. So Hans, you have a question. I think you would have got your answer, how to contact them. So I'll skip this. Varun Bhavra wants to know how to decide. So Varun and uh, Hardian Sizoli Adi. So they have this question on the standard protocol for phages, phage production. No, sorry, sorry, they're different. So I'll take Varun's first. He wants to know that, let's say you have a phage and how do you, um, how do you decide which phage to be produced in how much quantity to be stored in phage bank for phage therapy purpose? So is there a, yeah, some, great some type question. Of yeah, I think there should be. Um, it would be probably helpful to anyone to know those kind of standard cutoffs, if we could eventually establish not, you know, requirements, but recommendations based on what others use, like for different phages, like I worked with Campylobacter phages and the titers that we would get, you know, you could, I, I, there would be a certain titer that I would know would be sufficient for stability in the fridge, you know, maybe 10 to the six, that would be kind of my titer. We never got much higher than, you know, 10 to the seven PFU per mil with Campylobacter, but up a T4 phage, you know, that would be a, such a low titer for that kind of phage. So I think we, the answer is we don't have the exact specifications yet, but um, it's something we want to crowdsource and bring front and center, like any kind of standards that help people uh, be more successful, more likely to succeed with keeping their phages alive longer. And yeah, John, do you have anything to add? Um, no, that sounds really good. Yeah, we, we're we definitely crowdsourcing that because we've heard so many ways of, of doing that. And some, um, one of our past capsid articles, they talked to a lab that doesn't have power like every 24 hours of the day. Like, so they have to find creative ways to store their phages. So it depends on your lab conditions and what equipment you have. And same thing for uh, bioinformatics too. Like there's so many ways to do everything. Like some labs have access to supercomputers and they like, like we're clusters and do like all these other crazy things that we don't even have access to, right? But then other people have very few resources. So we wanna be able to crowdsource the method that works best for you. Like if you only have you know, less than a thousand dollar budget, or if you have like a hundred thousand dollar budget, like your methods might be different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, since I'm reading in order, I would have taken these two comments in the end, but I would say now Rohit Gokhale and Indian Kandasamy, they both are complimenting you, Jessica and Yon, for the great Thank presentation you. and all the best for your, all your ambitious project. And this is indeed an exciting endeavor. Thank you for this presentation. I think this is for everybody, but they have put it. But still, your questions are not over, so let me come to, I think, the final <laughs> questions. Uh, SK Tosif Ahmed, he wants to know that, is there any opportunity to use bacteriophages to decrease the mortality rate amongst the patients infected with SARS-CoV-2? 
can you say the last part again? Reduce the mortality rate. Among the patients infected by SARS-CoV-2. So, oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have been approached early on in the pandemic by um, some researchers that were interested in this question and saying, can we kind of band together as a phage community and start preparing a library or a collection of phages that work against the, some of the bacterial isolates that are being collected from COVID patients? Because we do know from historical, like in the literature from past flu pandemics, for instance, a lot of people that died actually uh, autopsies show that it was um, frequently bacterial caused potentially, or at least they had co-infections. So it's not really known as far, I think the research is ongoing to find out if this if bacteria are playing a role in mortality of these patients, but they're certainly going to be colonized with bacteria and that's what we're hearing. So there, so if that's true, um, that means that there's going to be strains to be collected and there's going to be phages to be collected against those strains. So we, um, we kind of started collecting interest from the phage community a little while back and we, st we paused it because um, it just kind of was too crazy at a po that point in the pandemic. Like doctors have to be involved in this to be able to tell us more about the clinical reality and they were just kind of swamped. So I think it will come up as like a new initiative. And we've seen funding go in Finland to one group that we work with for looking for phages against COVID relevant bacterial strains like co-infection. So I think we're just at the beginning of that. That could be like another big um, wave of phage need because maybe those strains are, are different and maybe we don't have phages against them yet. So they're going to need to be found. And they need to be tested also, the secondary infection. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if anybody, because they might be treated with phage antibiotics, but then they're being antibiotic resistant and then there's a need to use phages. I think exactly. we haven't reached there, but this needs to be discussed because phages might be exactly. there already. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, Hajian Suzoli Adi, uh, Hajin Adi asked this question, that last question for the day. Oh no, there are too many more. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dr. Gopalath, you have to tell me, I mean, how many questions can we take? There are several thank you notes, beautiful answer questions, several thank you notes actually, they're not questions. Uh -huh. so actually, uh, <laughs> I, I feel they should personally email and get their answers yeah. because yeah. time yeah. is yeah. limited and then we are so grateful to the uh, this session actually we are highly motivated to be the part of the phase directory and really, the phase directory has become accessible manageable and shareable so we feel like that the part of the uh, phase directory so thank you so much jessica and Jan. So now hand over thank to thank you yeah, uh, no, just just a second. I was about to ask the last question. So, okay. uh, the, the rest all are compliments, uh, thankfully. So, excellent presentation. Radhe Sharma is saying using phage uh, is great. And Zulfikar Menti says great session, great responsibility. And I must say them because you deserve it very well. And you, Zulf, as Naomi on, John says, thank you for sharing. Uh, Kaushik Rajara, Mamita Day, and uh, Guna Raj, they all are thanking you very much. Ananda Raj and and just last question is that from the same person I was asking when I you know, I asked Professor Gopalat Hajian he asked that uh, are there any standard protocols for clinical trials on phage therapy contexts like the vaccine production phases phase as in um, are there any standard protocols for clinical trials on phage therapy? Great final question. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about this since the conference last week with the biotech uh, phage professionals. Because that's, of course, where the conversation is for them is how do we do phage clinical trials? And um, so we're getting into looking at how we can support, like kind of in parallel to what we're doing to support researchers collecting phage data. How can we provide a platform that supports the clinical trial aspect? And even if that's the one by one patient by patient um, sort of N of one clinical trials or compassionate use. There's, it's the same problem. It's, I mean, it can be, it's a different problem that could be solved by the same strategy. And we're really keen on supporting that part of it too. Like the positive feedback loop we showed you is kind of the researcher specific one, but we have another one that really involves all the clinical aspects too. And um, yeah, we are, 
there aren't any standard protocols is the short answer, but there should be. And that field, that side of the field really believes that. And they were really excited to know that, oh yeah, that would be great to have kind of, what are the community standards for what you should measure when you put phages into patients? And that's been the reason a lot of clinical trials have failed so far, not because the phages didn't work, but because the just certain logistical issues that could have been prevented with more of the systematic approach that really draws from the expertise of everyone who's tried all those aspects before. So thanks for that question. Yeah, we're excited about that too. So now over to Professor Gopalan. I can't thank you enough, Jessica and Yon, for your uh, such elaborate answers. And I'm sure everybody got their answers. And as, I, as Professor Gopalan said, that if there are questions remaining, there are some still. So please ask those questions. My apologies that we could not take all of them. But uh, they are very friendly and they are very prompt in answering that I assure <laughs> Yeah, so kind, of, kind of question. So thank you, uh, Dr. Urmi, so much. And uh, before that, thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you so much, Ayan. And we are really in in the phase directory right now. And uh, uh, it it seems that we are trying at the clinical preclinical studies we are doing for the septicemia. We are also working on the surface use, like in the chronic infection, acute infection. And we have also tested for the uh, say oral use and its toxicity. And also we have seen for the antibody response by putting the subcutaneous infection injections to the rabbit model. And it's really very safe till date, whatever you have found. And we tried to approach our health authorities at the national level. They are still insisting that we should go for the uh, safety studies in the animal models. Then we'll be giving this one permission for the uh, clinical trials, but uh, we have done some clinical trials and we are planning to use the phase therapy in the chronic infection model, uh, well planned the clinical trial using the huge number of the patients. So that will give something. But before that, I think it's very, really very useful to use the phases for the as you are working on the campylobacter that they can be eradicated by oral use. And oral use, we have found that even 10 to the 20 is also very safe, not causing any biochemical change or the, wow. uh, they say the, I, this um, interleukin levels, interleukin 6, 10, 4, and interferon gamma. We have studied those things. We have seen the histopathological examination also that is not getting affected. And no, no uh, behavioral and physical change is happening in the control as well as in the study group. So we have done this for, say, I think uh, for a month giving the high dose 10, 10 to the 15 and 10 to the 20. And uh, this is really very safe. And we are working to handle or to, to, to eradicate a targeted bacteria, which is causing some problem. So this is the stage we are there. And then for the septicemia for using the systemic model, and we have pinned down to the dose, safe dose to the rodent model. And I think that will be safer for the human being also. But we are just waiting that some nod from the health authorities that they are permitting us to use these phases at the couple state ground, but we don't know what will happen. And I'm thinking that we should keep on working. And it's really great to have the phase directory. We'll love to be the part of this. And uh, once again, I would like to thank you, both of you. And then uh, the two pillars of our SBRT India are the Dr. Urmi and Dr. Taruna. They are doing, doing great job. Actually, we I am the clinical microbiologist, basically. So I'm too busy with the COVID-19 diagnostics. Yeah. So really working 12, 14 hours. So I just came from the lab and I'm sitting here before you. But it was so interesting yeah. that I'm not feeling tired at all. We'll have to another um, interaction with you both of yeah. you in future. Yeah. So, and Professor Vinod, are you here? Professor Vinod wants to say anything. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Is he here? You're welcome. You're welcome. We'll have to talk okay. soon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Professor Sanjay Chipper, do you have to say anything or do we close the session? You're, you, you're on mute. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shy. yeah, the lecture was very interesting and we thank both the speakers for enlightening us on the various aspects of uh, um, the Farge Bank, which they are running, and the potential it has 
for the younger generation especially who are getting into this business um they will be benefited by this lecture i am very sure uh, including us also because we are the fast scientists and we are working on pages for so many years now but this kind of a facility and as you said in your lecture this sometimes we lose these pages and many a times they are very very important for us also so if we have this kind of a facility where we can deposit and we can share it with others will be a good facility and i'm very happy that you are into this business and you will have more people who will join you and others will be benefited by your own experiences as well thank you so much thank you both the speakers thank, thank you. you so much thank you have a good day and thank you yeah. audience for very interesting questions and <laughs> uh, keeping this session so interactive and live uh, thank you very much to all the participants Wonderful. also and of course the organizers my lab students ritu pritam and saroj and dr taruna anand as i told you she is also maintaining a page bank so she is very happy to hear yes. all your initiatives about all right to you with that thank you so much bye bye thank, thank you. you good night good morning <laughs> good night bye bye, bye.